these two office workers are planning ahead for their weekly staff meeting. But what they can't possibly plan for is a surprise visit from Spaghetti. Let's watch. Spaghetti! <laughs> These guys are so spooked. I got you. I spooked you. Yeah, that will do. Hello everyone, I went... Oh God. It's gonna sound really bad. We're gonna have to dub over this. At least I don't have to lip sync. I'm gonna have to look like I'm talking though, or do something, so I guess I'll just do a little dance. Decades and decades and decades ago, when Cthulhu was introduced to the world, it was legitimately scary. Not least for the fact that it was so unknowable. That was the spooky thing. It was alien. It was incomprehensible. To look upon it was to lose your mind. But over time, pop culture has done what it does. It's codified, tropified, and turned Cthulhu into merchandise. He's a plushie now. You wear him on a t-shirt now. His mystique is gone, and with it, a lot of the horror. Now I'm happy to eat crow on Silent Hill 2 Remake in several areas. I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. Bluebird actually kept a lid on it when it came to discussing mental health and trauma, which historically the studio has handled with ignorance, recklessness, and some very dangerous messaging. But hey, they got through every single Angela scene in the remake without screwing everything up, so brownie points there. However, Bluebird gonna Bluebird, and the studio's predator for hackneyed horror tropes has inspired today's video, which is all about horror games, monsters, and what happens when overexposure to a scary thing punctures the mystique. <sighs> right, off we trot. Go, go. Less is more. No other genre benefits more from the classic rule than horror. It's not an absolute rule, of course, not every horror story needs to be withholding, but when it comes to doing a lot with a little, media designed to scare you takes unique advantage of the concept. After all, one of the most primal human fears is fear of the unknown. To be afraid of the dark is to be afraid of what it can hide. One of the most frightening aspects of death has always been the mystery of what happens next. I mean, I know what happens next. You get served a notice to join skeleton jury, so you can judge others for bone crimes. At least that's what my dad told me. Then again, he got arrested for setting fire to a kid dressed as a Ghostbuster on Halloween, so... What can be more anxiety inducing than a threat we can't see, can't hear, can't know? Only one thing is scarier. Walking into your kitchen at 2am to find a spaceman looking in the cupboard under your sink and when it notices you, it just shuts the door and runs at you. I don't care how brave someone is, if a spaceman rushed them at 2 in the morning, they'd shit themselves. The unknown comes a close second, well a close third, the other scary thing is someone looking through your bedroom window at night wearing a Mr. Mime outfit just bashing on the window, just bash bash bash. One of the most effective things about the Blair Witch Project is how you never find out for sure what's out in those woods. Well. At least until 2016's Blair Witch ripped all the mystery out and left us with nothing to play on our minds anymore. Revealing the source of the fear comes with a risk of making it too knowable, too easy to understand and far too familiar to fear. We all know how desensitization works, we've all played enough Grand Theft Auto and then beaten a sex worker with a dildo, at least according to Fox News. The more you're exposed to something that makes you feel a particular way, the chances of that thing making you feel less increase. At best, overexposure to horror media will make you less scared of it, and at worst, well, familiarity breeds contempt. Speaking of contempt, Fuck the mannequins in the Silent Hill 2 remake. 
things Blooper Team could have fucked up with its reimagining of my favourite game of all time, I could never have predicted that chief among them would be the mannequin monsters. My god, though. When it comes to breeding hatred through familiarity, the Silent Hill 2 remake's near clownish over-reliance on this spoopy quartet of plastic legs might be a true crowning moment. The mannequins of Silent Hill 2 were just one of the freakish creatures that came staggering from the psyche of professional hole fingerer James Sunderland. They occasionally stood completely still, so your monster detecting radio couldn't pick them up, a trick that Bloober Team turned up to 11. And hey, the first time I saw a remake mannequin scurry away and hide, I was impressed. They're using stealth now, I thought that was bloody cool the first time I saw it. The first time. By the end of the game, I was so sick to fucking death of the sight of mannequins that I no longer want to see even real life shop dummies again for as long as I live. No amount of words can do justice to the genuinely fucking ludicrous number of mannequins hiding behind things that have been comprehensively soaked into the entire game. From their introduction in the apartment to the very final act, they are everywhere and they have that one trick. They hide behind something and try to ambush you. This weak attempt at a jump scare occurred so astoundingly often that before the game was even halfway over, I became able to predict if a room had a mannequin in it based purely on its furniture and layout. I could walk into a room, see some shelving units, say, there's a mannequin in there, and I'd be right. I would always be right. Even if I were to merely guess if a mannequin was around, I'd be correct more than half the time. Again, I truly cannot describe to you how many mannequins are in the game, to such an extreme degree that getting ambushed by shop dummies becomes the single most predominant aspect of the entire game. It's as if Bloober Team thought the entire point of Silent Hill 2 was mannequins, like James Sunderland had a traumatic experience in a department store. In my restless dreams, I see that shop Silent Primark. Getting ambushed by mannequins becomes the dominant driving force of the whole experience. Well, I say getting ambushed, but for that to be entirely true, the spammer quins would have to actually be good at hiding, which they aren't. They are, in fact, fucking terrible at it. They stand conspicuously around corners, crouch under desks that face you so they're fully exposed. Sometimes they just press against a wall in plain sight and hope for the best. And the more mannequins there are, the more of a laughable comedy they become, to the point where I took this beautiful image. You can practically hear these two fucking morons giggling tee hee to each other fucking dumbasses. After just a few hours of playing, you get so thoroughly used to spammerkins that not only do they fail to get the jump on you, you start easily getting the jump on them. And don't get me wrong, Batman Silent Hill would be an awesome fucking game. But I'm pretty sure the point of Silent Hill isn't to feel like Batman. Silent Hill 2 Remake has a lot going for it, but the gameplay and the horror associated with it have been almost single-handedly fucking wrecked by this one enemy and its one predictable, incompetent, and thoroughly pathetic jump scare attempt. It's actually worse than the repetitive QTE jump scares in Callisto Protocol. Yes, it is that bad. Through the mannequins, Bloober in essence becomes Spaghetti from Tim and Eric, hiding obviously and openly, grinning with dopey self-satisfaction because it thinks it's so fucking crafty. Someone replied to my tweet about the spammerkins with a gif of Spaghetti, and that was funny enough. Then I got to the Lakeview Hotel where, I shit you not, they started literally hiding behind potted plants. I saw somebody back there, I thought it was our boss's kid or something, because he'd been back there for like 10 minutes messing around, and, and then he uh, jumped out, and I saw it wasn't a kid, it was actually a, a full-grown man. That was kind of surprising. Something I wish more horror game developers would realise is that overexposing their monsters is the fast track to destroying their monsters. I often call this process of destruction slendering. After the classic horror game Slender 8 Pages. I fucking hate Slender. It's a shitty little scavenger hunt made ten times more annoying than it already would be thanks to the obnoxiously noisy troll harassing you the entire time. And that's what it feels like. 
trolling harassment. You're trying to find these stupid bits of paper in the woods while remembering where you are and where you've been and the whole time you're trying to concentrate you're being followed loudly by this utter fucker who won't just leave you alone for 30 seconds. I know there are people who find the Slender Man myth terrifying and I think an hour of playing eight pages would cure them of that terror. He's so fucking frustrating, so insistent on getting in your way that he very quickly stops being a threat and starts being utterly annoying. It's hard to be frightened of something that just annoys you. Slender is a great example of how familiarity really can breed contempt. Amnesia The Dark Descent is another classic of the genre and the design philosophy of this one is very different to the games we've just discussed. A lot of what makes Amnesia so scary is purely atmospheric. There are monsters. They don't actually appear very often though. Instead, the game preys on your fear of the monsters, using them just enough to remind you they're out there, then using all manner of audiovisual trickery to let your mind do the rest. So savvy is Amnesia, it even discourages you from so much as looking at them, since doing so reduces your sanity meter. It's a good thing Amnesia does this too, because have you actually seen what the monsters look like? Some things are better left to our imaginations. But that is another point. A lot of monsters, when you just see them in broad daylight, aren't actually all that scary. A lot of them look quite goofy. But with the perfect lighting, camera angle, just the right level of obscurity, Goofy shit can be fucking terrifying. It's a delicate balance. You don't want your monster to be such a consistent factor that it becomes overly familiar and predictable, but you also don't want it so peripheral it's barely a threat and easily forgotten. And sometimes it's just about having the right introduction, something that sticks with you. One of the most iconic abominations in games must surely be the Nemesis. Introduced in Resident Evil 3 as an unstoppable, implacable, well, Nemesis. In the original version of this game, many of the Nemesis's appearances are scripted or in very specific locations. He's not up your ass 24 7 and his appearances are so big, so memorable, so fucking scary that when he's not around, you're still thinking about him. You just dread being in the dark and hearing stars. And that's the mark of a truly great horror antagonist, one that doesn't constantly jump out at you to make you afraid because it simply doesn't need to. It's already burned itself into your brain so horrifically effectively that the fear of running into it is scarier than actually doing so. A great antagonist makes you paranoid, it has you jumping at shadows, turning corners with your breath held long after the last time you saw it. The first time Silent Hill 2 players encountered Pyramid Head, he was inaccessible behind bars at the end of a hallway and he did nothing. He just stood there, staring, waiting, the only sound being James's radio flipping out. It wasn't chasing you, it wasn't attacking you, and it was all the more terrifying for its horrible, patient inactivity. Because it wasn't a threat, it was a promise. This thing is watching you and it will become your problem when it decides to be. Maybe in five minutes, maybe in an hour, but it's watching and it's waiting. A little restraint goes a long way. Silent Hill 2 keeps Pyramid Head in reserve, only using him a handful of times to great and very particular effect. And it's actually one of the things the remake does really well. They retain that presence. And hey, I don't jump scare easily, but Pyramid Head's sudden appearance behind me on the Brookhaven hospital roof almost made me shit my own skeleton out. He'd been gone from the game just long enough that I'd started to forget about him, but after that moment I was well and truly paranoid. Paranoia makes you afraid of things that aren't there. It has you creeping around corners just in case, because you truly never know when the bad thing's coming. In Silent Hill 2 Remake, I was creeping around corners not because I was afraid something might be there, but because I was confident something was, and I was right all the time. I was checking under beds and behind shelving units out of tired, near instinctual routine, not out of anything approaching anxiety. Horror devs really need to understand the difference. It's not paranoia if they are all out to get you. For a non-horror comparison, Dark Souls is a game that uses ambushes very well, I think. In a typical Souls game, the greatest density of hidden enemies tends to be nearer the start of it, such as the various undead soldiers strategically placed around the undead berg. A couple of behind wooden boards and furniture, there's one or two in some corners as you enter a room, not a ton, but enough to set the tone of the adventure you're about to have. 
enough to teach you to be careful. Other ambushes occur throughout, but not all that often unless you're really carelessly rushing. Those few near the beginning, though, imprint themselves on you, and you know to look around you. Look around you. Compare that to the 2023 Lords of the Fallen, where there's an ambush around every other corner. I actually really love that game, but the sheer volume of annoying enemies hiding in crannies to shove you off ledges gets real old real quick. A lot of games fall into this trap, they learn the wrong lessons from Dark Souls. From Software may have been too good at imprinting those ambushes on people, since I've lost count of how many devs think a Souls-like is practically characterised by ambushes and cheap shots. Which brings us back to Silent Hill to remake. Compared to that, Lords of the Fallen looks like a bastion of self-control. While the mannequins are an incredibly extreme example, they're part and parcel of Silent Hill 2 Remake's insistent overexposure of all its monsters, except Pyramid Head. SH2R has a brand new combat system and it wants you to use it to the point of practically forcing you. The original Silent Hill 2 incentivized avoiding its monsters wherever possible. James wasn't a good fighter at all and it was a lot easier to give creatures a wide berth or get past them in some other way. The remake has a diametrically opposing philosophy, avoidance isn't just disincentivized, trying it is impractical and foolish. Enemies are more aggressive, more fast, and follow you from room to room where before they couldn't open doors. In the game's many tight spaces, trying to explore, solve puzzles, and consult the map is damn near impossible until you stop the monsters harassing you. Just like the Slender Spam. It's harassment. There are so many monsters and they won't leave you the fuck alone. They're so in your face you can't help looking at them in great detail. Like the Spamakins, your first encounter with any monster in the remake is cool and frightening. Each creature has its own erratic set of movements. The animations in that game are great. Each one is durable and vicious. And your first fight with any one of them is a frantic and unpredictable scramble. But then it happens again and again and again. The durability of the monsters makes for a tedious hindrance before too long. The viciousness becomes annoying incessance. The frantic unpredictability gives way to repetitive routine. The jittery misdirection and almost serpentine evasiveness of the remake's mannequins starts out as a brilliantly challenging prospect. I legit struggled against them at first, but now I can fight them perfectly. I've been railroaded into fighting so many of them, I know their movements intimately. I went from being in intimidated by them to being able to fight them in my sleep. I couldn't not become excellent at fighting them. I've had to do it so many times, I'm a legitimate expert. Spaghetti! Spaghetti! People forget one really interesting thing about Team Silent's survival horror masterpiece. Silent Hill 2 wasn't a very hard game. Notably, it's one of, if not the easiest of the series. It didn't need to be hard to be as scary as it was though. Not when it had unsettling imagery, horrifying themes, and masterfully anxiety-inducing audio to do all the heavy lifting. Some of the scariest parts of Silent Hill 2 are parts where the player is actually perfectly safe. That initial walk to town through the forest trail with the uncomfortably prominent crunch of distorted footsteps surrounding you. The prisoners in Toluca that are completely invisible but cause James to look up as if seeing something unnaturally tall. Even though combat is negligible, I've never gotten sick of Silent Hill 2's monsters. And I've played that game over a dozen times in my life, whereas I've played the remake once, and I'm over every single one of them. I was long before I'd finished my very first playthrough. The original didn't force me to fight hundreds of monsters. It made sure doing so wouldn't benefit me more than just sidling past the things. As a result, their mystique, their thematic resonance, their creepiness has endured in my mind for over 20 fucking years. One particular moment in Silent Hill 2 terrified me more than anything in any other game. As you head to the hospital's basement door, there's a sharp scream of a baby. It lives rent-free in my head. It's not just that it's a jump scare. There's simply something about the pitch and tone of it that makes me feel like my bones are being shaved under my skin. But all it really is is half a second of an audio clip and a cheap old jump scare at that. But it just happens that one time, completely upsetting my sense of security in a stairwell that had been well-established as monster-free. 
That half a second of audio is more impactful, more horrifying, more effective than a hundred stupid mannequins hiding behind a hundred potted plants. I always loved the mannequins of Silent Hill 2. Such a fascinating, eerie and symbolic design. I've loved those leggy monstrosities for 20 years. It took Bloober Team a few hours to make me never want to look at a fucking mannequin ever again. Stamping the feet really hard on the concrete. My foot hurts. Right, back to dancing because we've got the outro today. And there you have it. I must stress again, I actually quite like Silent Hill 2 Remake more than I thought I would. It got a 7.5 on the gymquisition.com and that's a good score, a very good score, especially for fucking Bloober. Anyway, I'm off now. Oh, uh, October 27th, I will be in Manchester for Pinfall Pro Wrestling. I will be tagging with Gain. that's Gay Kane, and I might be going as The Undertaker, well, The Commander Taker the biker version. I'm going to get a little trike. It's going to be great. Thank God for me and all that.